So today we're going to be talking about geologic modeling fundamentals. And I want to first thank MapTech for their sponsorship and support as um, the technology and exploration webinar series sponsor for 2022. And they really do help make programs such as this happen. Okay. Um, my name is Maureen Moore Roth, and I'll be the webinar uh, moderator today. And I'll provide you a little bit of background about myself. I am an economic geologist and educator. I've been a geologist for 15 years and have had the opportunity to work with so many great people um, and so many different assets aspects of economic geology. So I've been able to work at the state level, labs, uh, mining company at a college, and now um, I work at a technology company where I can kind of um, cultivate all of my experiences and help other people in this space. Um, and here's kind of a collage of a lot of my field experience. Um, I really do enjoy being in the field, whether it's, um, you know, at a mine or exploring, um, um, whether it's professionally exploring or spurlunking on, on the side. Um, and then also, I really do try to engage with other economic geologists as much as possible, um, as you can kind of see from some of my SEG um, sponsored field trip pictures as well. Today we will be um, kind of going over a little bit different style of a webinar. So we'll go over some high level content um, to provide you um, a little bit of content about the topic. If you're not quite in the industry yet and you're a late stage co you know, college student or early in your career, maybe haven't been exposed to geologic modeling, we'll go over some basics. Um, and then we'll have all of our panelists go through and uh, provide their experience and some tips and tricks or um, comments for you to really um, explore. So we'll be going over geologic modeling, what data that we can be using for the model, um, validation practices, both spatially and statistically, and then we'll go into more about the ore deposit geometry and the importance of that in our uh, modeling workflow. But first, we're going to go over some introductions. Um, Carlos Vargas is going to be joining us here in a little bit. So I'm going to skip over his slide for right now. He's an exploration geologist. And as they do, he's traveling right now. So he'll be joining and we'll add him um, back in a few. So next up, um, I will introduce Jake Anderson. Jake, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Thanks, Maureen. Uh, I'm an ex uh, economic geologist as well. Uh, prior to MapTech, uh, on the picture on the left, I served as a mine geologist uh, up in Wyoming in the Powder River Basin, uh, conducting uh, dewatering programs, exploration, geology, resource modeling, uh, and even uh, reclamation design. I have nine years of experience in the industry. Uh, I graduated with a Bachelor's of Science from the University of Nebraska in Omaha. And currently, uh, I work at MapTech as a technical success manager. Uh, prior to that, I was in the technical services department where I consulted, trained, and then uh, held for support for um, MapTech products. Uh, so my uh, background is in uh, stratigraphic modeling and strata bound metalliferous deposits and aggregates. Uh, so uh, I have a strong background in uh, you know just doing layered bedding modeling uh, and different aspects of different types of commodities. Thank you. And Marianne, do you wanna go ahead and kind of tell us a little about yourself? Sure, thanks Maureen. And thank you to uh, the society for the opportunity to participate in today's panel. Uh, it's a really great series and I'm happy to be here to share my knowledge and experience. Uh, my name is Marianne Hildebrandt, and I am a practicing geoscientist registered here in Ontario, Canada. Uh, currently, I am focusing on a master's degree in earth and energy resources leadership through Queen's University. My journey uh, to becoming an economic geologist is unusual compared to others, other in the field. Originally, I intended to go to law school, and at the tail end of my BA, I actually rediscovered my love for science and leapt into a degree in geology. So luckily, after uh, finishing my BSc, uh, I found a summer geology position logging and sampling drill core for an exploration project. In my 16 years in the industry, I have led production teams, uh, production geology teams, monitored production activities, 
uh, managed ore extraction strategies and maintain 3D uh, spatial, geological, and resource models. Essentially, my role um, has predominantly been to identify opportunities and risks from a geology perspective and make recommendations to maximize revenue generating potential of an ore body. I've had the great pleasure to work in many amazing locations across Canada in, in some of our more remote and certainly chillier temperatures uh, in the northern parts. And when I was working for De Beers, my career took me to countries such as Botswana and South Africa. What's great about a uh, geoscience career is having the good fortune to learn more about Earth's history, its people, and how we're all connected. Well said, thank you. <clears throat> Um, before we jump into the topics here, I do want to provide two more disclaim or two disclaimers. Um, the first is today's presentation, we will be exploring how these industry um, geologists leverage technology to make better interpretations for their um, their projects and to quantify and understand uncertainty. But to reduce some bias, we do want to do try our best to be neutral when it comes to software tools. And we'll be speaking more in general terms. Um, so if you were looking for technology based and exact tools and stuff, you can always talk with us after, but we're really wanting to focus on the content and the material and uh, share some experiences. And the second one, um, is that the goal of this webinar is really to provide you guys and girls and everyone to some mentorship and guidance and education. So when it comes to you making the decision while you're in the industry, um, do you work with your team to make sure it's the right call for your group? Awesome. So now we'll go into geologic modeling while we're all here, right? So a geologic model is, in simple terms, a 2D or 3D um, interpretation of geologic parameters. It can look like a cross-section of a triangulation surface or a surface that um, tells us the contact. Um, it could be CAD objects. It could also be a three-dimensional block model. So it can look very different, but the thing that isn't different is the importance of the geologic model. It is the foundation of all of the decisions we make in, um, in an operation, right? So from the exploration side to reclamation, these we will be kind of looking at those um, at the geologic model. Um, and so the, the geologic model will look a little bit different when you're looking at the mine design, the mine planning, economics, or the business model, but it will be used in all of those decisions. And it is, you know, the, the foundation and um, of, of all of it and understanding and being a really good geologist is actually the most marketable thing you can do, I would argue, in your career. The next thing we'll kind of look at is the mining cycle or the mining value chain. You hear this a lot. Um, just this, it's just the different stages of your the from exploration to reclamation, what it would look like. Um, so we have exploration, hopefully discovery, development, production, and reclamation. So from what we've talked about so far, we do um, Jake and Marianne do have a, a lot of background in in a variety of these stages. But I think anyone on this call would um, would argue the that the geologic model should be reviewed and add to for every um, stage and some of these stages you know you might go to exploration get to development and then you might need to go back so this is an iterative process if i was able to to draw all the different options for all the different deposits i've gotten to work with it would be a lot of arrows for sure um, So the next thing we're going to look at is the geologic modeling workflow. This is a very high level, um, you know, graph or, or, or graphic of the process. And you'll see the, the main components. So collecting the data, validating it, characterizing your geologic domain, interpreting it, validating it again, and then sharing your findings. Those are the main pieces of it. And these percentages are the um, time percentages that I have seen with, with a lot of the team members that I've worked with at a variety of companies and deposit types and stages of the mining cycle. Um, so now what we're going to do is I want to invite the um, the panels to see if there's anybody, if Jake and Marianne, if you guys have any other feedback on the geologic modeling workflow, or if there's certain timeframes that you know you've worked with in your your career that would 
you would like to speak to? Uh, one thing that I like, I really, you know, constantly uh, do and also kind of explain is just like the dual parts of validation. I feel like those are so critical uh, because, you know, we're collecting a lot of different types of data, uh, trying to make sense of how that data relates to the story we're trying to tell. And without data validity, it's really hard to justify, you know, your hypotheses. And, and I feel like, you know, it's, it's awesome that like in this graphic, it's representative of over a third of the workload. And, and I think that's a fair representation of, you know, of validation. Thanks, Jake. Marianne, do you have anything to add? Is that that time frame seem realistic and percentages to what you've done at the various companies? Oh, um. I think it can be <laughs> um, representative. Uh, I think, you know, depending on um, how much change is happening in a model update, like if you have an original model, that's one thing, but if you're you know, expanding or, or adding new value to a model or changing sort of the material um, amount of, that's, that's being um, the volume or size it's in a material sense, that communication piece at the end could actually be a lot more time intensive uh, because it's important that your stakeholders are actually well informed on sort of very large changes or material changes to a resource. Um, so that could be because you've added uh, a great deal of value to uh, a project because you've done some drilling and sampling and you've got some, you know, maybe deeper parts of the deposit that are better understood, or maybe you've actually identified an area of risk and you're saying that maybe changing a portion of that model from being economic to now being marginal or, or not economic. And so if you're in those kinds of things that are important to your stakeholders, you might actually spend a lot more time at the very end, um, giving them that uh, understanding and knowledge. And I would agree with that too, like, especially with the mining lifestyle or life cycle, excuse me. Uh, you know, there, there's certain portions where that communication to stakeholders, whether they're internal or external, is going to be a very key factor. But that said as well, I mean, validation, data validation is, is uh, fundamental to all of this. I mean, you can't go and sell uh, the, your story if you ha can't actually put your hand on, on how that data was uh, prepared and understood and analyzed. And um, yeah, it, and the quality that sits behind that model, uh, anything where you're building confidence and that's what's happening in those validation stages. Anything, anytime you, you build confidence in the model, it'll be easier to explain to others at that later stage what's, what's happened or what's going on. Yeah, good point. And I like how you said story, because I feel like once I made the switch over into economic geology, I felt like I was more of a storyteller than just a scientist, because that's essentially what you're doing, right? If you, you do all of this and you are not good at communicating and sharing your findings, then all of this might be wasted, right? But if you, you also, these other pieces are important. And even going back to the previous slide of the mining cycle, all of these are going to be used and, and, um, like was said, that sometimes you will maybe earlier on in the, the project, this will be a higher um, percentage rather than the other areas. But that's why we would probably want to leverage any kind of technology enhancements to help, you know, reduce the labor associated with these things so that we have more time to be with the geology, the geologic data and be the geologist like we want to be. Awesome. Great. Oh, and um, so now let's go ahead. We're going to do a quick poll um, to kind of see where everybody's at. Um, and we want to understand at your company or if you're at school right now, um, you know, if you've done internships, let us know what what really determines the method, the geologic modeling method at your company. So we'll give you guys a couple of moments to um, sort through some stuff. 
and good will. And I, I think we might have mentioned this, but great comments in the chat right now. So we'll definitely be revisiting those in the question and answer. And it's good to, to see some of the names in there too. So some of which are have been my mentors over the years. So yeah, the question here that we're asking is what determines the geologic modeling method at your company? Is it culture, geology, management, best practices? And just do your best. If it's, uh, um, if you're not really sure, um, feel free to not fill it out. If you're not at that place in your career yet where you, you would know. Okay, I'll give you a few more moments. Alrighty. How are we doing, Deanne? Do we need to wait a little bit longer or, or are we able to kind of show the results? I think we're ready. Okay, cool. Thank you. Alrighty. So yes, as good geologists, we really do want the geology to be determining the modeling method. This is super rewarding um, because I think the majority of the, the people in this um, webinar are going to be coming from that uh, background, right? So kind of geology rooted. Um, in a lot of cases, we'll be talking about it here in a little bit, is the um, the different options or, or different things that actually happen with re reality. So we'll go ahead and um, close that poll for right now. Um, and then let's go ahead and talk about this. So Jake, um, from your experience, do you want to talk about how culture and um, geology could determine the the method and kind of speak to some of your experience? Yeah, I mean, right away with culture, you know, we live in a global environment in mining, uh, like Marie or like Mary can attest to, you know, she's worked on a lot of global projects, you know, myself and, and you included have also worked on a lot of global projects. And we work with a lot of different teams that are assembled with you know, individuals from different parts of the world. Uh, so culture, you know, right off the bat is one of like, you know, just obvious culture. The other part about culture is, uh, you know, there, there is some regionalism, uh, you know, some regions are taught different methods uh, or have different, you know, ways to, of sampling procedures. And then finally on the culture aspect that I would bring up is, as you get down that mining uh, cycle, as you kind of become into more of a production environment, if you enter into your career or you are a production geologist, or if you go into the early exploration, those different avenues within the mining life cycle is going to kind of change how you perceive, you know, your modeling updates and everything. And sometimes we even see producing, producing sites that are driven by you know, this is a geologically driven deposit or this is a production driven deposit. So there's a lot of different uh, avenues um, from just like the life cycle culture of a deposit that kind of affect how you would model and make decisions. Good point, yep, awesome. And Marianne, what about from kind of the management, geology management and best practices, can you speak to, um, yeah, from your experience? Yeah, I think there are kind of multiple ways we can think about that question. I mean, software and technology are evolving. Um, so it is giving us a greater ability to create multiple iterations at the click of a button of the same deposit really quickly. So it's important that you create that for geologists that we start to think about the processes and what's going on behind the modeling and taking an, a measured approach to our work to mitigate the risk for our clients or, or our company. Um, from a corporate perspective, uh, there could be an established approach to producing a geological model. Um, it's important in these cases uh, to understand the prescribed approach because there could be actually better ways to do this or easier ways to do this, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the approach that was taken um, is, uh, is a may, it, it might just be outdated, we'll say. Um, so it's possible that, you know, you might identify that there's a software that you can, you can do this work faster or more efficiently. 
Um, and then you have to decide how you're going to approach that management of change. And that's really what you have to go through and think about is how do you get a newer approach adopted um, if the old, if the other methodology, the current methodology is not um, necessarily keeping up with, um, you know, keeping up with sort of the times and also keeping up with uh, current best practices in the industry. And that's the other side of it, right, is thinking about best practice. Um, how are you actually capturing your approach to the model work? It's one thing to say you've done the model and you have this, you know, new, maybe um, interpolated um, 3D, you know, solid or something. But did you actually, do you actually know how you've done it? Um, did you choose uh, to exclude data? And if so, what was your scientific reasoning for doing so? Um, sometimes you might intentionally exclude information from for like practical reasons, maybe the QC uh, failed, um, but there could actually be other reasons why you choose to exclude data. Uh, and it could be because it was produced in a different um, or a distinct sort of methodology, or it has a different um, confidence level that maybe would detract from your overall uh, model. And I mean, as Maureen was saying earlier, we have, um, you know, this idea that these models are created for a purpose, right, either for mind planning or for resource estimation or something like that. We use models to offer guidance when making decisions. And if we, um, if models are used for the wrong purpose, then it's possible that they could even be, uh, lead to poorly informed decisions. And that's really something um, to consider when around how, how you communicate in those models out to other groups. Great but point. I mean, yeah. <laughs> ultimately, like you are looking to build a model um, with the highest degree of confidence, right? Achievable, given the limited information that you actually have about that deposit. Um, so that it hopefully would be classified as one as, uh, you know, at some level as a mineral resource. So it's important to think through the steps carefully, how it's constructed. And then of course, um, you know, document, 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 document everything um, that you've done to produce that model so that uh, you can have confidence in the work. Yeah, great, great point. And to kind of follow up a couple of things about document, right? Um, so we have a couple great comments from um, Robert North and um, Odin Christensen about the importance of that, those earlier steps, right? Mm -hmm. And that being able to document and be have it clear for somebody else to just pick up and understand is going to be key for um, using it properly, right? So any of us who create those geologic models, we have all made our maps, paper maps, digital maps, logged core, you know, of collected samples, and we it's it is sometimes sad to see what is used and what is not and it's usually because of the lack of um you know quality check quality assurance or um you know qaqc or just the comfort of that practice at the time too so if you're able to document and and share what you did then that geologist who's taking it up or um if you're using technology to process some of that data it will be accepted most likely um, rather than if you haven't documented your findings and stuff. So being able to communicate properly and finding those details are, are really key. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of focus on too, um, you know, we a bit mentioned to it, um, but I think Marianne mentioned clients. So as a, a, a geologist, you know, our clients are the coworkers that we're working with. Um, if we're in the exploration standpoint, that could be the, the other collaborators, investors, at your um, development stage and your production stage, those are all different, right? So don't just think of it as, oh, a client is someone that's transactioning funds. No, it's people that you're working with. And to be a good, uh, uh, you know, a successful economic geologist, you should be thinking about economics of what you're doing and understanding how the work you're doing kind of relays into the, the overall picture with the clients that you're working in. Um, and then I think it was another important concept there was change, I think change management, um, which is 
a concept that is used a lot of times when you're kind of going from different stages or changing practices. How does that all work? Um, I really would argue and, and encourage everyone in this call to think more about how to promote a change culture. Um, because we, you know, a lot of us that are in the technology world, we have new technologies that could help um, really speed up some of the data collection or processing. But being, uh, you know, being sure that you're taking the time to understand and being open-minded to it, right? Asking the questions, being able to articulate the questions you have about the validity of the technology, but leveraging it so that you can spend more time with your geology and communicating with it. Um, so on that, does anybody from the panel have any other comments or anything before we move on? I would say like one of the biggest things is, you know, you have to maintain your level of creativity there's constantly uh, a justification on if you're producing something in a 3D environment that makes sense, but also allowing that creativity to see, you know, do I have some sort of structure affecting this? You know, a lot of times everyone just, you know, focuses on grade, 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 you know, and, you know, that we're not, we're not grade geologists, we're, we're, we're geologists, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out the, the story of the environment. Uh, you know, and so if you just modeled everything from drill hole intercepts for grades, sometimes you you lose that aspect of, well, why is that grade there? Uh, what alteration and mineralization signature should I be looking at? Is it structure driven? Uh, it's just if you can, you know, make you yourself open minded to the point where you can see all those different facets of what's going on in the depositional environment, it makes you a more robust geologic modeler. Good point. So then next, we're going to um, kind of go to an, another question. I wanted to give it some time because I know a few people were kind of arriving late. Um, but Deanna, can we um, load up the demographics? Because then we'll use that as well in kind of our conversation to kind of understand where where are we in our group? Do you guys, um, do you have a lot of experience? Are you still in school? Go ahead and fill out that um, Pull those polls right now as you can, and we can kind of go over those. Just so that we can kind of um, tailor this, the conversation and stuff to see where everybody is. is. All righty. While you're finishing that poll, um, I want to introduce Carlos um, to the group, and um, we'll go ahead and give him a moment to um, introduce himself. Thank you. Uh, you. You had a fun day already traveling and everything, so I'll let you go ahead and kind of provide the group with a little bit of a background um, about yourself. Oh, and uh, you got to unmute. Double. You might have a uh, Dan, um, it might be that we were, when you came in, we had you on mute. Uh, let's see if, one second, Carlos. Just trying to sort out the... There you go. Okay. We can hear you now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. First, like, I apologize to be late. Yeah. Travels, uh, changes, last minute. Okay. My name is Carlos Vargas. I'm an exploration geologist. I'm working currently for Barrick. Uh, I did my master in New Mexico Tech. Uh, and I have been working in well, mainly in Africa, in different places. And currently I'm working uh, with Barrick in Pueblo Viejo and Dominic Republic. Uh, here are like some photos <clears throat> that uh, I really like. Uh, well, the photo on the left is like in Zimbabwe. You can see the nice pillow lavas. 
and then the other photos are like exploration in different parts of Africa, uh, in Congo, a little bit of regional exploration, then uh, Tanzania, uh, and then the, the right at the bottom is in Zimbabwe. And the middle one in here is one that I really like uh, for this seminar because this is kind of a 3D model uh, of one mine in Zimbabwe, kind of old fashioned style. It was really, really cool because it's basically the entire mine and the key geologic elements uh, there. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Marina, I don't know like, if you want oh, to. No. We're yeah. good. Yeah, so now what, um, to kind of get you a bit caught up, we were just talking about what determines the method that we would use to for the modeling method. Um, and normally we would go ahead and kind of fill out what should, but the results from that original poll kind of gave us the answer we're looking for, right? The geology should be really um, be determining the method. So on this point now, um, we're going to kind of open it up again to the panelists to, to talk about how in their experience, the geology or lithology, alteration, mineralization structure kind of has uh, helped driven those, um, those modeling methods. And then Carlos, um, if you basically how we've been kind of running through this is if you're not chatting, go ahead and put your own self on mute and then we'll, the panelists will just kind of view who's not on mute to know who's talking and not, um, okay. unless you wanted to, to kick us off. <laughs> We ready to roll? Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, one thing uh, I can contribute to this conversation, uh, I actually took the picture in the center. Uh, so what's going on in this situation is we have uh, layer bedding in um, a Texas lignite deposit. And traditionally, a lot of people, you know, you think of lignite or coal, especially in Texas and Wyoming, uh, there's just this kind of assumption that everything is just flat. And expansive, but you can have a lot of these offsets that actually occur due to diagenesis. So this one's a relatively small scale offset and it's a listric offset. So not only are we identifying the actual structure type, but we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, how is this affecting my mineable unit and, and understanding the geometries um, or how the deposition of a, a certain deposit is from a scientific perspective, you can then have the ability to like mentally see what's going on. And, uh, you know, then you can go about trying to figure out ways to model that those types of, you know, events. Great. Anybody else from the panel on how different structure, lithology, alteration, mineralization, or combination of, uh, or geometallurgy could, could really help you determine that method? Yeah, I think, well, for me, geology is key. Um, so every single deposit is different. So I think like it's important to understand like the different elements from the core to the 3D, like integrating everything. And then based on that, like alteration, well, I, I always focus more like in structural geology I have like that tendency of getting like um, the structural geology first. And I think it's really important because like, yeah, the structures are key in like uh, being like feeders or like then cutting the mineralization. So uh, to draw like any section like in 2D or 3D, I think is, is really important to have like those elements first and from there, like building on is kind of like a puzzle, always putting all these pieces together. Um, and then also going to the micro scale is, is, is important, like kind of that fractal analysis to be applied on, on the deposit. Um, lithology is key, especially like those units that are more reactive. Um, that also that affect uh, alteration at the same time. Um, so 
based on that and also the amount of information that um, define uh, the potential model method, I think like uh, in places that where you don't have much information, uh, sometimes it's, it's dangerous to use like uh, implicit modeling. So you need to be careful on, on playing with uh, the model method. I think when you have more information, sometimes it's, it's better. So also like the styles, right? Like folding or like more planar, more like massive uh, and the comp contrast between the units is, is also uh, yeah, important features to consider when you're like modeling and trying to understand in the geology. Yeah, good point. So we we all I think we can all agree that geology should be the the main part, and then underneath geology, you know, it sounds like lithology, structure, alteration, mineralogy, and the combination of that all is important, right? So how does it handle like what is the result geometallurgically and geotechnically as well? Um, because as exploration geologists. The goal is to find something that is economical to to push into production. Um, so yeah, and then the other thing I kind of kept hearing is, you know, it sounds like a lot of us are a bit biased on what we like and stuff. But the good part is, you really want to have a geology team. So you don't really want to be out there by yourself. Obviously, because of budgets and reality, you might be um, you might be the one person on that project. Um, but start to develop your your network, right? Um, to, to reach out to and collaborate and understand how these all pieces, all these individual pieces kind of tell um, a bigger story. Great, so we'll move on because I think a few of us were, you guys were kind of going through um, a few of the questions as well. So the next thing we're gonna go into is um, the validation and pre-modeling consideration. So we'll go ahead and do another poll because it, it would be interesting. We, you know, we've just talked um, the poll that says, where do you save your data? Um, we want to really understand right now, whether you're wherever you are in your career, when you're collecting geologic data or when you're reviewing it, if, if you weren't the one that has uh, collected that data, how is that stored? Um, so we'll go ahead and um, load up that poll so that we can kind of understand that because that's really going to help us understand where everybody is on, on that capacity. So where do you typically save your data? Paper, CSV, SQL Server, general mining package, other. And feel free to also, you can type it in the chat if there's you have other um, methods and stuff there. So if it's an other and you want to be um, chatty, not shy, Go ahead and fill that out too. And then also I kind of noticed that some of it says single choice. So do what, whatever is the most um, prominent for you, right? Because for some people that might be all of them. So just kind of the, the most, your majority of how you store your data. Okay. Oh, um, it looks like some can't see the poll. So if you can't see the poll, um, just dump in the, the content or um, in into the chat and we'll we'll kind of keep going there. And we're going to have time in the um, question and answer. So if we want to, um, yeah, discuss more of it, we should have time there as well. Okay, so um, can we go ahead and show the results of the poll if if we're at that place? Great, so it kind of looks like um, we have a variety of people that use paper, CSV, SQL Server, a general mining package and other, and we have some um, comments in the chat about what that looks like and where. Great, so um, the next thing we need to think about is the, it kind of shows everyone understands the importance of where you're saving the data. The next thing we wanna think about is how do we spatially and um, statistically validate the data before, 
and after the model generation. And then what is the purpose of the model and you know what is the importance of that? I think Marianne and Jay kind of talked about this a little bit, but I'll go ahead and open it up for the panelists again to, to kind of talk about um, these components as far as the validation and the pre-modeling consideration. Uh, so, you know, one thing that I always like, you know, try to, you know, explain is like, you have, like, first off, like where you're trying to figure out where you're trying to find a localized area to save your data, it's always important to understand the limitations of the technology that you're trying to use uh, to store that data. Uh, and, and if it's extractable, because there's there's no sense getting data into a, a database that you can know that you can't use uh, with proper you know import export or ODBC connections, uh, and you know for like the step number two is uh, you know just like at any given point during the data validation and collection phase, it's like your utmost responsibility to try to limit the amount of you know bias that you put whether you're only sampling an outcrop because, you know, you think it looks good and it's the driving area, but, you know, maybe you should go sample other areas within the region that you're studying. Or, you know, sometimes there's a selective bias. Like what if you only have one outcrop to work with and you're, you're, you're doing a surface sampling campaign? Uh, but you just need to understand, you know, how that bias is going in. And that is, and bias is a por portion of that validity step. Because, uh, you know, you're trying to tell the complete story, not just one part of the story. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, by using that bias reduction uh, and just trying to tell the complete story uh, of your deposit, you know, I think that's kind of a good way to consider pre-modeling considerations. Great point, because once you finish the pre-modeling considerations, depending on what method you use for modeling, you you may that might be the last time you kind of engage with the process to tell that story. Um, and it looks like, Carlos, do you have something else to add there? No, I think, yeah. Okay. I just want to, to add, yeah, something else that, um, like, also is, like, well, um, the modeling depends on well, many aspects on the data, especially if you have like historic data. That sometimes is a problem because then you need to work with that historic data and sometimes it's not uh, great. And then like, uh, as Jake was pointing out, like the, the bios is, is really clear in, in some of that data, depending on, on the outcrop or depending on the geologist. So trying to put everything in 3D is, is the key for me, like to check like on those elements. Um, and then to review, like not just like geochemistry data, because also I think you need to QA, QC, like your structures, again, with the structural data, because that's a layer uh, data set that sometimes is not uh, being QA, QC, and it's a really important one. So um, that's uh, one point that I want to, to bring out, like the QAQC structural data and also well, all the geochemistry and the geology mm -hmm. um, for the modeling. Yeah. What about, um, so we have different purposes of the, the model, right? So we talked about how the model is used in every stage of the mining cycle. How does the purpose of the model really um, change maybe what you're looking at validating and, and other pre-model considerations. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true, right? Like the purpose of the model, like yeah, sometimes like early stages in exploration, you're trying to find like uh, some like hints to get you to a discovery. But then like when you're in a more advanced deposit, then you're trying to get like those points to uh, maybe replace ounces. So then you need to hunt for like areas and deposit to try to get like more ounces into the mine and, and, the, and the life of mine. Um, and yeah. another important thing here is the geometallurgic uh, part, because that's something that needs to be included since the beginning, since exploration days because sometimes can be like, or can look really 
nice with uh, nice intercepts, but then it's, it will be pretty much impossible to extract it. So that's key in the economic decision and the modeling. Yeah, absolutely. And how many key, we have like five key or 10 keys of things that we need to focus on, right? So it's going to be a lot of this is going to be on balance too, of, of kind of balancing all of these things, balancing the most collecting the right data, validating it, figuring out how to model it and stuff. For due time, I'm gonna move on to the next slide and then we'll, so just to make sure we have enough time to cover any questions, because I see a lot of really good questions coming through the, um, the chat there too. If that works for everyone. All right, so next, because um, I think we were already kind of talking about this, right? So remember, for, for anyone that isn't working with the you know, geologic domains, that's just a, a term that we use to really um, define similar populations. So whether that's a geologic domain based on lithology, alteration, or a combination of all of these, um, that, that's kind of what we're referring to. So I think um, for the sake of what we've been doing, I, I think we covered a lot of this. Does anybody have any from the panel, is there any other points that you wanted to chat to before we move on to the 3D geologic interpretations? Uh, yeah, just like on the metallurgy part, like, you know, Carlos brought it up, you know, we've kind of danced around it a little bit. Uh, you know, it, it, not only just metallurgy, there's a lot of other aspects that are cross-discipline that you need to consider. You know, I, I mean, Mary's been in, a, has a lot of experience with the production side of the environment. So, you know, it's just, you just got to understand the method of, you know, what you're trying to do. And um, sometimes that involves understanding processing techniques or engineering design. Uh, all those kind of come into play. You're not just a geologist, you're communicating with people from cross disciplines. Good point. Absolutely. I think it's also important to have the different models actually available um, at your disposal when you're trying to make decisions and maybe trying to paint a bigger or bigger understanding of, of what has happened and how this maybe the deposit was in place. Um, you know, because in theory, they should speak if eventually to the same story, right? Just a different explaining a different piece of that puzzle. No one model will answer all questions, but all models together should be able to give us uh, a greater resolution on, on what we're looking at and how, you know, maybe where your, your um, grade bearing material is ideally. Very well said. Great. So next let's talk about um, when we're, we're we have all, have all of our data, we think it's valid and we're ready and we have, have it kind of flagged or grouped out into different codes we, of sorts. Now we can do either 2D or 3D geologic interpretations. And for this one, I really do wanna kind of talk about what are the geometric shapes that we model. Um, we've already kind of talked about the properties and, and geologic properties that we'd be focusing on. But what about um, the different shapes? And then um, what type of methods would you use for the modeling method? So we have explicit modeling, which is normally, you know, your drawing interpretations and, and using that into a, a, a 3D geologic interpretation. And then the implicit modeling is, is typically referred to as your mathematical modeling. And there's, if you we could probably do a whole month long <laughs> webinar on just the methods there. So at this level, we'll just use those three terms, explicit, implicit, and hybrid modeling. Um, and if you ever, I, I see a lot of good questions coming in the chat there, we'll, we'll try to get to, and we can also um, discuss after the webinar too. But yeah, who wants to kind of chat more about the geometric shapes that they've worked with and, and kind of what methods handle some more than better than others and such? Hi. Hey. Yeah. Well, um, I used to work a lot in organic deposits. So then like the shapes are, well, like organic deposits uh, usually present at least one to two to three phases of deformation. So then like uh, there is a lot of complexity on the deposits and then multiple shapes. And on those multiple shapes, you have like folded and refolded uh, deposits, then you have also 
deposits that are more controlled by uh, bryology, competent contrast, and deposits that are more kind of uh, linear or planar, kind of shear control deposits. Um, another deposit that also is complex are like the BMS deposits. Yeah, modeling BMS is also really complicated, a little bit similar, but not the same as high sulfidation deposits that are uh, kind of volcano, right? Like, and then the volcanoes, you, you, you can imagine like yeah, right now, like a volcano. And then we're trying to model that volcano with all the elements, with all the dynamics, with uh, all the units. So in terms of geometries, like I think it's key to understand everything since the core again. Uh, for example, like for folded deposits, and you need to understand like uh, how many phases of deformation, which ones are the key. And for that, stratigraphy is key, right? Like especially if you have well, when you have like marker horizons or like a package of marker horizons, is is really really important to understand like that like uh, stratigraphy, and then like the elements of the folding, like the cleavage, um, the hinge, like the intersection lineation. And usually, like the folding is not alone. Sometimes you have like shears that are like breaking apart like other domains in terms of structures, um, which is different from like more like uh, planar or linear deposits in which you, when you have like inflections, are going to be the key for like uh, dilational um, uh, higher grade like areas. Uh, so for those ones and everything like kind of the approach that I try to use is usually like um, first like logging the core, then like paper sections, level maps, and then 3D trying to integrate everything. And also uh, on the stages that I join, like the modeling is trying to solve particular uh, questions on the controls of mineralization. Once we have like those elements, like on these multiple shapes, shapes, um, then it's kind of easier like to try to put the rest of the information together. So um, for me, it will be more like this hybrid model, the one that I, I use more in these multiple shapes. And I think it's, it's really good uh, because then make you think uh, in a proper like scale and, and then like it make easier like the 3D modeling and, and do you do that in phases or um, where you'll model pieces of it and subtract from other areas and stuff? I know, I know Jake has had experience with that, but Carlos, for, for the situations you've described, how do you normally handle that? Um, yeah, like since, since I get to a place, I try to put everything in 3D, like uh, so basically logging and then modeling at the same time trying to see like those elements that I have on my core or like the surface, I can project it and it, I'm trying to see if I, I can um, find evidence, for example, for a shear in multiple holes. And then like that give me also confidence on like historic data if they look something similar. So trying to join the two is, is, is important and key. Awesome. Um, and in future webinars, we'll talk about how to, to leverage more of that technology to, to better understand the story of the complexity and everything too. So stay tuned on that. Awesome. Jake and Marianne, so, do you have anything to add here? I do actually to build on what Carlos was talking about. Um, so yes, you can have um, the ver you know, various geometric shapes as, as listed there on the slide, but it's one thing to actually think about the fact that you, your overall deposit could be, be, and I'm thinking now in a volcanic kind of structure, could be very vertical deposit. Um, but at the same time within that deposit, you actually could have um, a population uh, that you're modeling from a resource perspective that is actually amorphous. So you can have multiple different sort of geom geometric shapes depending on how, what scale you're modeling at, right? Um, my, a lot of my background is in the diamond industry. So there is, there's different approaches to how you model. And, you know, that's uh, something to, to think on um, that uh, one approach might be to model this way for that purpose, maybe for structural reason, but then, you know, as you are building other geomet models or um, a resource estimation, you might actually choose a different path. 
point. And that and that's kind of a, a good point too. Like I, I have a lot of experience with hybrid modeling where you, you do one set of modeling to like kind of model the the initial like geology and, and lithology from a formational or members point of it. But a lot of times you got to realize like what type of environment am I in? Am I in like an epithermal, um, like a VMS, like Carlos stated? And sometimes like, especially with precious metal deposition, you know, the metal is just not a metal, it was transported by fluids. So oftentimes you have these structural conduits that were considered areas of, you know, least resistance and those fluids are traveling along these structures and, and depositing their different alteration signatures and their mineral mineralogy. And oftentimes you have over imprinting on all these different, you know, alteration signatures. So you may have a really nice, you know, anticline all modeled out and everything from a, a like a like a horizontal or even amorph or structural type of standpoint but where those conduits of those fluid movements are occurring inside of that structure in the anticline that's going to be where your resource is and so you will have like flat lying structures and then sometimes in more of an amorphous or implicitly modeled uh, mineralization inside of it yeah and the nice part too is that it's like Sometimes, you know, uh, in our world, if the model isn't what you're expecting, people immediately get frustrated. If I know the inputs are good, I actually get excited because then that means that I don't actually understand the story and maybe there's more, more to it, more to it, meaning more economical material, right, to, to extract. Awesome. Yeah, also, I think like an important point is that sometimes you can have multiple events of mineralization. And one can be more like disseminated and the other one Different will be more like vain. Yeah. So then like that can be also tricky and that's something that uh, can change the way like of modeling like uh, more like disseminated like mineralization than a vein style mineralization. Well, and that even comes down to like your actual mill process. Like if you do department studies on your milling, you know, certain pulses could have associations to different mineral elements. So like your whole processing procedure is then defined by the geology by these different pulse events. Cool, awesome. Well, for time, because we have a lot of good questions, I'm gonna move on to the communicating of results, right? So I think we did talk about it a little bit, but when you're communicating, I think we all mentioned the importance of that, but what does that look like? And, and how, how does the time frame of what that looks like differ from one project to another? I think um, your slide a while back with all of the different thin sections and outcrop photos um, was sort of what I really love that slide, but it, it's sort of typical for the geologist to approach management with really detailed slides or diff and information that is way too much information for um, how to sell a model to others. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful slide though, as a geologist, I love it. Um, but knowing that um, we need to actually communicate this uh, information about, you know, the volume, the size uh, of and uh, the amount of, of maybe economic material that is contained within this model. Um, you need to really tone down the geology and sort of amp up the simplest, uh, the simplistic way to sort of explain things. I'm really doing a poor job of doing that right now. <laughs> But we're with like minds, so that's okay. So understanding yes. <laughs> what situation requires the detail and what situation doesn't. <laughs> exactly. So, so you need to actually like think about who you're communicating with when you're going to present your model. If it's again, yes, with like-minded um, people, because you you'll have to go through a peer review process, obviously, with uh, when you you know, are ready to present a model. Um, so your peers in geology that will be working within your company or um, within your organization, those folks will understand and love that detailed report and presentation um, because they're gonna ask you all of the technical questions. But then you step out to actually present it further to management um, or to a board, that's when you need to realize that those details are no longer important. They want to know what's the size of the prize and how much risk does it carry? And they're trusting you that you knew all the detail and how to, to exactly. deal with it. So <laughs> let, take that as a compliment and be aware of that situation. <laughs> Jake, do you want to add to that? 
Yeah, like one time I one thing I kind of figured out early on in my career is sometimes like being too overexcited about something and then sharing that with the wrong person that may not have that technical background, like, you know, like a manager or, you know, someone that has like an influence on like the, the share or the publication or marketing of a deposit. And then all of a sudden you get really hyper focused about this awesome, exciting thing. And you, you assume some things internally, but you explain that to someone else and they take it and run with it. You know, now all of a sudden you make a offhanded joke. Oh yeah, we've got, you know, gold in our deposit. Well, now all of a sudden it's being communicated that, you know, maybe I'm a lead zinc operation, but now we're producing gold. Uh, you know, so there's certain things that you have to be regimented in your communication with other parties, uh, just so that way these rumors or grandiose ideas don't come back to you. And then they point the finger at you if that's not true. Even though you knew it from the get go, but you were just really excited about something and it just got miscommunicated like a game of telephone. Mm -hmm. And your energy, like, so just kind of focusing on that, because a lot of us as geologists, we get, ex that's why we're probably outside is because our parents are like, take that energy outside, right? Um, so, but be realized, and, and if you're not good at it, if you have impulse controls or you don't, you're not good at the situational awareness, you can learn it and you can reach out to any of us. Anyone working with me knows that I've worked on that for a long time. <laughs> But Carlos, you have something to add for communication and sharing findings? Yeah, no, I agree with um, Jake and Marianne about like the, the public, right? Like uh, depending where you are talking, like then it can change like the message. Um, just I want to elaborate that I, usually I really like to put like a section or like a map um, with like, uh, as Marianne were, was, she was saying, uh, with the size and then like the economics, because at the end, like depending who you're talking with like then the economics is really important and also uh, what you're looking for is is also important so like a big like size or like small size can be uh, depending on the company then one that i really like love to do is videos like uh, to share like uh, with geologists and and sometimes i get uh, that you guys were saying like overexcited and i put music and everything so <laughs> yeah we were looking at you really Carlos, like, uh, so just kidding. Yeah. Well, and it's, so, yeah, one of our mentors actually would always say, think of it as like an, uh, you know, home improvement HDD TV show for anybody that watches that. Like you're basically trying to share the vision that you're working in, but you do want to be careful of what that is and, and kind of be on the cautious side of um, holding back a little bit and ask, having them ask for it rather than being that level of energy because they it may not be well received, right? Um, but with that, because we do have a little bit, um, I think we're kind of going through some of the questions that people have, but let's go ahead and I'm going to summarize kind of the main takeaways so far um, and kind of add a couple of things that we've learned along the way. So no one would argue that the ore body knowledge and understanding in data validation is kind of key for a good geologic model. The other component is having the ability to do dynamic interpretations and communicating those are going to be really critical for a robust geologic model. Because you don't just want a model, you want a robust one that allows you to pivot in a variety of ways and using it for other purposes. Um, it is key for um, the mining cycle and the value chain, and it is going to be an iterative process and it should be dynamic. And along this way, as we're doing here, you do want to make sure that you're communicating, discussing, collaborating on these interpretations with everyone that's appropriate, right? Um, and, and working with that team. And then also along the way, trying to develop that situational awareness of who should I be having these conversations with? Who can who can kind of help in different aspects of it? And, and being okay with the fact that you, you may also have just like the data has limitations, you might have limitations and leverage the team that you're working with or your social and professional network like the SEG group um, to, to fill in those gaps. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and um, switch it on over to the Q&A discussion, um, if that works. So looking at the questions, I'm kind of gonna try to, was trying to read through those, um, oh, let's see. Um, so um, let's go through, and we have about 20, a little over 20 
minutes to kind of go through this. I think I saw a question. Um, what was one of the most complicated things is to make a model that represents reality, right? So do you think we should use 3D interpretations or also 2D? So, um, well, basically everyone kind of round robin, anybody who wants to, oh, let me stop sharing my screen as well. So when, um, when you guys are ready, go ahead and kind of speak to those as well. So would you, what would you argue? <laughs> Yeah, no, like that's true. Like, and I think like one one key element is to check the geology right now. For example, like working in a high sulfidation deposit, uh, the question is how a high sulfidation deposit looks right now, which is basically a volcano. So I had that question, and uh, well, then we I usually also participate with the people of the University of Costa Rica doing other like modeling and research and things. So then the question is like uh, an example of a high sulfidation deposit is a one a volcano in Costa Rica, which is the Poal volcano. So then like I dropped that question to the people. Why we don't model like uh, the Poal volcano? And we see how is like a high sulfidation deposit. So then now we start like trying to model like that volcano with all the information available. So then that help us on, on what's the geometry like of a volcano because we're like studying like paleo like volcanoes same with like for example bms deposits then like uh, you have like current like uh, studies on like multiple active uh, bms deposits in the mid atlantic reach and other regions so then like taking those geometries and trying to see like uh, that is not like the cartoon that we have for the bms right like typical cartoon like is that's not the shape at all. Like it's more like uh, complex than that. So modeling like uh, that, I think, and trying to get the reality is is difficult. But then like taking those examples is really important. Also for structures, one thing that I really like is the uh, models that are like on the sandbox with all the contractional and different like movements. Then you can see the the patterns of um, the structures that are not like continuous. And so taking all those examples for like a, a kind of like actual geology or current geology um, are really important to, to bring those ones into the model and thinking like how uh, that applied to, to your geology, keeping the, the geometries similar. Good point, awesome. And there was a comment. I love that there's so many um, experienced people in the, the group tube helping. So we have three panels, but I feel like we have a lot more in the group. And it, someone mentioned from the group about, you know, a lot of times between 2D and 3D, it is a game time decision. Um, and it will depend on like the data and the project that you're working on too. Awesome. Yeah, like, like if I'm doing like a giant soil sampling campaign, I'm going to model that two dimensionally because I'm not applying a three dimensional focus to it. Um, you know, so that's kind of a, a really good example of leveraging a 2D scenario, uh, you know, where you, you would do it for that situation. But if you were doing a lot of drilling, then you would switch it to probably more of a three dimensional aspect. Good point. Well, next question. Um, so it's uh, related to stratigraphic modeling. Um, What's the current state of play with modeling quality? What algorithms or workflows are recommended for modeling quality? So typically you, you model the structure first and you, you get your structure, uh, your roof and floors of your like horizons or units or seams, depending on how you're calling them, uh, which is a cultural thing, different parts of the world call them differently. Uh, but once you have your um, structure or your roof and floors, the top and bottom intercepts, then you apply uh, more um, numeric or uh, implicit uh, modeling techniques to then model the quality. Uh, and then that's, that's kind of how you would handle it. Great. Great question. Next question is related to um, data validity. And they're just wondering, so what, what do you all do for, um, to validate your data spatially and statistically?
I was just thinking it's a really big question. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I, you can tell my energy. I was like, I can help if you don't have <laughs> where, where uh, do we even begin? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a huge fan of box plots and histograms, uh, you know, just to get, uh, an idea of, you know, if I'm looking at a normal distribution in my samples, uh, and then once I can start figuring out associations, then I'll start going down and, you know, start doing like, you know, you know, two different, you know, element type scatter plots, then I'll go down into QQ or PP plots. Uh, but from a base level, you, from general statistics, understanding your quartiles and your histogram and knowing if you're in a distribution. I remember in college, I took st statistics, not geostatistics. And I was like, I'm never going to use this again in my life. And then I realized that, you know, I listened a lot in that, and that helped out a lot, uh, just understanding distributions. I think before you even get to that part though, but I love um, all those things that you just said, but the box plots and the histograms are great. Um, but you still fundamentally have to have a program that's sitting behind that, that's just doing quality assurance. So some means to check the data and keeping in mind that I saw that some of the folks on, on the call have said, suggested that they're using like CSV or sort of non uh, SQL based or non database uh, sort of programs. And it's really uh, something to bear in mind that in those sort of more looser for forums like, uh, like Excel, um, not to say Microsoft is great, but <laughs> um, in those more loose, sort of easier to manipulate formats of data that you can actually have a greater chance of error. And there's plenty of studies on that, that, you know, 10%, I think 10% of Excel files all have error within them. So if you're storing all of your data in maybe Excel, 10% of your records might actually carry error if you haven't actually done uh, the work behind, you know, making sure that that's quality data in there. Um, and, you know, if you can't put your hands on the quality data, it's going to be difficult. You're going to have more problems, you know, building and, you know, greater analyses on uh, for, from a statistical standpoint. And even just like practiced uh, validation. So a lot of your mining or exploration or drill hole related validation procedures are looking at things like overlapping intervals. If I'm from one meter to two meter, and then my next sample is one and a half meter to three meter, you know, I, I have an issue here because I don't have valid intercepts in my drilling. And so even just understanding those types of validation parameters uh, will come along ways to organizing that data and making sure when you get to this modeling procedure, you don't have geology going somewhere that you don't want it to go because you didn't realize that your drill intercepts were, were off. And it happens, we're human. Yeah. And then the connection to the, to validating, does it make geologic sense? Does it make mathematical sense? And yeah, so th there's there's different levels of it. Again, we we keep giggle but giggling, but it's like every topic that we're talking about, you could spend a whole month with any of us and and kind of getting that mentorship. And on that question, there's actually um, a question from the group. They want to know, um, having spent years as geologists working in the field, looking back in time, how important were those experiences for you in order to understand? the different factors which defines a mineral prospect and now being able to integrate that knowledge in the process of geologic modeling? Great question. So how your past experience helped you be good geologic modelers? Yeah, I think like <clears throat> the feel is key to everything. Like uh, since like day one, like uh, trying, well, getting into the industry, like um, you're learning every single day and then like, also moving from like deposit to deposit to like maybe different commodities also bring like new ideas on like targeting and also learning and like modeling and then like uh, sometimes like uh, listening to like uh, well multiple conference or like reading like uh, things like oh actually like uh, maybe I made a mistake here in this model that I need to go back and check um, but like the feel is the key, I think, uh, from like uh, logging to mapping and uh, mapping like surface, uh, mapping like trenches, mapping like in the pit or on the ground, give you like that really good perspective. And just not just that, just like mapping and then bringing that in 3D. In my opinion, that's, that's the key element uh, to, to work with. 
Yeah, and that's a great point, right? Like field is number one, right? In the last couple of years, things have gotten more challenging, but as exploration geologists, one of the skill sets you'll need to do, or as an economic geologist, you need to think about, well, what if I'm not able to go physically in the field, how can I still get that knowledge with the means that I have now? And I think the SAG student chapters have been doing a great job with the the, the situations they've been in, right? Um, but also if you're in that early career, SCG has a bunch of field assignment courses. Carlos and I have gotten to go on at least a few, right? Um, that really help you get that experience. And um, so, if if uh, locations or finances are a hard hardship, um, explore within the the membership uh, to see what they can help you with. So, Jake, do you have something to add to that too? Yeah, like um, you know, like Carlos is a for is extremely fortunate because he's an exploration geo, you know, and he gets to go out in the field all the time. Uh, my, I, my, or myself, I'm more in the, the resource type of an environment, which often means um, I'm sitting in the same spot I'm talking to you. So the, the field is incredibly important because as you progress to more of that resource stage, uh, you don't get those opportunities to go out and you know, practice geology that often. And, and you often get disconnected sometimes because when you're looking at data through an Excel or through a database or through statistics, you know, you have to rely on those skill sets that you learned early on, or if you have, or if you're fortunate to go from exploration to resource modeling, uh, you have to leverage on those skills to make deductive reasoning on how you are going to model and produce a resource. And if you don't have that experience, it's it's really tough to do that because you will somehow, some way, become disconnected, uh, you know, down the line through your, your career path. Uh, well said, Jake. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's, it's so, it's so important to be in the field. Um, having spent a pretty well all of my 16 years um, as a, either a site-based uh, production geologist or a site-based senior geologist um, or exploration geologist in the early days, um, you know, it's, it, you can't, you can't model in some ways if you're sitting far away, you can model, but how confident are you if you haven't actually touched and seen the rocks? Um, and that's um, something of a challenge, I think, for the industry as we do move towards, uh, you know, having um, more of our technical teams sitting in in sort of urban areas away from uh, perhaps um, our mine sites and um, and our exploration sites uh, is that we will lose that connection. Um, and, and having ha spent the early part of my career doing more geotechnical logging and sampling for resource um, purposes and whatnot, there's an, an, a level of learning um, about the techniques and, and the methods and approaches that were used in that period that inform every everything I do now. And I can't... Uh, I wouldn't undervalue any part of that part of my career and certainly any uh, early professional. It's, it's always, um, you know, you, people always seem, seemingly want to advance quickly in their career because they're looking to get that sweet job in whatever city that they're keen to be in. But at the same time, you have to be realistic about what you're losing in that space. Yes, you're gaining um, uh, perhaps something really awesome, but you might actually be missing something also that's equivalently awesome. Yeah, and, and I think the main thing kind of now being out of the field a bit more that I think I'm always craving and will always try to go to a client site or do a field assignment, um, whether it's professional or personal, is is the, the time that you have quiet time to kind of think about the story that you're working in and, and you get to be mindful about what you're doing versus when you're kind of working an eight to five job, sometimes people expect you to stop thinking about it. But for, for most of us, I feel like a lot of exploration and, you know, economic geologists, we're really creative and we're thinking past the five o'clock time too. So when you're trying to think about that, get as much experience as you can in the field and look, taking that time to be mindful. Um, I see a few people kind of nodding. So hopefully I'm speaking there. <laughs> well, and, and everyone says it's like a rite of passage to sit on a drill rig. 
but it's you fun. know, it's, it's, <laughs> it can be uncomfortable. Like I've gotten frostbite before sitting on a drill rig, you know, being in, you know, negative 60 degree Fahrenheit, well, Celsius too, uh, you know, temperatures, it, it can be uncomfortable. It can be intimidating. However, like, what are you learning at your core while being on a drill rig? You're learning about sampling procedure. You're learning about core and sampling QAQC. You're understanding the dynamic of, you know, he's trying to pull out the core bell, barrel right now. I need to have my box ready. You know, all of those things, as you get older through and go through your career, you realize, oh, wow, like this person put the cores in backwards, you know, and you can kind of assimilate yourself or like look back at like even just the working environment. Well, maybe they put the, they put the cores backwards because the core tube came out the wrong way. Or maybe it was so dang cold that they just wanted to go and warm up really quick because it was really, really cold. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a lot of that aspect that you lose if you don't have that experience. Good point. The next question is, um, what are the different types of 3D modeling? And is there any difference between numeric and geologic modeling? So I think we might, this was kind of early on, so we might have answered some of that. But does anybody want to um, summarize that for kind of the differences between implicit, explicit, and hybrid? Want me to? Oh, you got it, Jake. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of different ways, uh, like Maureen mentioned, explicit, implicit, and then hybrid. Uh, with explicit, you're, you're physically stepping through sections, either drawing them and registering them and then, trans, you know, transposing them digitally. Uh, or, you, you know, you're just trying to make section interps through whatever, you know, technology you're using. Uh, implicit, you know, uses mathematical formulas to and algorithms to basically, you know, figure out the how that shape looks with nearby surrounding data points. Uh, and and those two, like in, explicit modeling, could sometimes look very rigid um, and like wireframey, whereas the implicit modeling can be, you know, very artistic looking. Uh, both have their, their pros and cons, uh, but a lot of times, depending on the deposit type, you'll see a merge of the two. And then that's what's considered hybrid. And then, and then finally, there is statistical modeling through geostatistics like simulation or other you know, numerical modeling um, estimation parameters that basically all it does is run off of the core statistics and then it populates and builds your model that way. So that's kind of more of a geostatistical kind of theory-based kind of side of the modeling um, where you're not as hands-on. And so, yeah. And then another good question, well, this will probably be our last question for right now because um, we'll do kind of a wrap up, but in the rest of the questions, I'll work with the panel to, to kind of review and answer those and we'll, we'll email them to you. Um, so we do have one more question. How do you visualize and communicate the 3D geologic um, uncertainties to the management? Nobody? Okay, that's <laughs> good. Yeah. Well, like, like there. Well, usually, like, depending on the model and the information, like, um, you, know, you can have also two ideas or two models, especially in exploration. Like, yeah, sometimes, like, okay, this is the model, but also, yeah, it can be in this way. Um, on the sections, like uh, the uncertainties, like, usually, like, I try to not like uh, draw like the entire section, like, in the areas that I have questions, I just put a question mark. And then on the 3D model, also like um, we well, I try to identify which areas we are not sure about it. Like um, this is more like for exploration part, but then like for resources, I think yeah, it will be a, a different uh, story um, that it will be like classified uh, on all the different parameters uh, depending on the amount of training. Uh, but yeah, to communicate, like sometimes it, it can be complex depending on the audience, like uh, the people that you're communicating to. Yeah, good point. And if a lot of these questions, like I said, we'll try to um, send you feedback as well. Um, and then if the panelists feel comfortable sharing their LinkedIn, you can feel free to, to kind of, I don't mind, I'll put mine in there um, and 
feel free to reach out if you have more questions because there's a lot of uh, additional information that we can provide um, as well. So we have three minutes left and I kind of want to, um, I'll need one minute to, to do a wrap up, but if you guys want to provide one piece of advice for early career professionals, um, what would it be? Well, go to the field. Go to the field. <laughs> Yeah. Get comfortable boots and socks. Yeah, go around like as many deposits, as many places. Yeah. Awesome. Jake, Marianne, do you have uh, an addition? Yeah, like constantly be hungry for knowledge. Uh, a lot of times, you know, your, your career may not give you the experiences you want, but you can always, you know, learn about things, you know, constantly reading about deposit types, uh, even just reading technical reports from companies as they're trying to, you know, sell and explain their deposit. Uh, and then in addition to that, like find mentors, like I've been, you know, fortunate to have, you know, three or four mentors in my career that have made very, you know, significant impacts on my personal and professional development. And, and, if you don't have someone to kind of talk to or ask questions to, sometimes you will just make internal assumptions. And a lot of times, you know, you get to hear amazing stories from a lot of colorful people and just amazing experiences or not so good experiences. But I, I feel in the world of economic geology, you know, you just, you get to learn about the world, you get to learn about the earth and you just get to learn about culture and being able to, talk with people and have people as mentors is amazing. Great. I just added the SEG mentorship page as well. Lots of good resources there. Um, to add to already the list that they, Carlos and Jake have uh, provided, I think it's also important to ensure that you're being true to yourself in, um, in the work that you're doing, um, choosing a company that fits your core values and aligns properly with those. Um, and, um, and making sure that, uh, you know, you don't uh, put sort of detract from who you are and, and, and always be working to, you know, a better, to better yourself, to better the company that you're working for um, as much as you possibly can. Um, the other thing that I have found, which I think some young professionals don't always think about is possibly getting involved either in, um, such as the Society of Economic Geologists, so here we are today, um, or getting involved with um, the, the groups that might be licensing your um, geoscience um, uh, career or, or other associations that are important to you within the professional sphere, you know, maybe volunteering to uh, coordinate a conference or whatnot. Um, I didn't do that till late later in my career, and uh, I realize now that it's actually been quite a fruitful um, endeavor to uh, give back to geoscience. Thank you. And then on that note, I'm going to um, share again because we have the last thing I wanted to kind of um, speak to was the upcoming. Um, conference here in Denver, Colorado. So um, this, this uh, August, we actually are going to be having the SEG conference in Denver, Colorado. And um, it's a great opportunity for students and early career professionals to come and meet people as well as um, go ahead and, um, oh, and you guys are able to see my screen too. Oh, nope. <laughs> technology sometimes, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, we, so go ahead and um, if you go to the web page, you'll be able to find the um, option to register or submit an abstract. And uh, it's really, really important to, to do these things because it's a place where you'll be able to make your friends, your professional and personal friends throughout your career. Um, and I would like to just remind everyone that the abstracts will be open until the end of this month. And if you have questions, um, feel free to reach out to the coordinating team there. I sent my LinkedIn information, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I know I've, I've been personally active within the organization and at conferences, and I find it really helpful for just professionally and personally as well. So on that note, um, we will be sending out at the end of this, you'll be getting a survey that um, we just ask that you 
take a moment to fill out. Um, we use that for future, the, the society will be using that for future um, improvements to the webinars. And I really hope that um, everyone had a, a good session today. Sorry, we went over two minutes, but I think those two minutes will be valuable for you and um, look forward to have you all attend the next one in June, June 9th. So with that, thank you so much. And thanks for all of the panelists. Great work. <laughs> thank you.